Last episode, we introduced the Carthaginians, who claimed hegemony over the Mediterranean. But Rome was now becoming an increasing menace. By the early 200s BCE, the Republic was still dealing with the Etruscans to the north, although they had been significantly weakened. Now all that lay in Rome's vision was an Italian empire, and the conquest of Magna Graecia. Lucky for the Romans, these Greek city-states weren't united under any single polity. They were all independent, and often bickered, but remained under the protection of one major city. On the mainland, the most powerful was Tarentum. And they were more threatened by Rome usurping their influence, than by Rome conquering their peninsula. Tensions would heighten by 290 BCE, after the breach of a treaty, and around 284, the small city of Thurii asked Rome for protection, rather than Tarentum. The Romans sent a garrison to Thurii, provoking the Tarentines to declare war. Not all Romans or Tarentines wanted this war, but both sides felt forced into this conflict. Meanwhile, in the east, lay another kingdom. The Kingdom of Epirus was an independent Greek kingdom which rested on the Adriatic coast, and absorbed into the Macedonian sphere through Philip II's marriage to Alexander the Great's mother, Olympias. The king of Epirus, in the late 300s BCE, was Pyrrhus of Epirus. Pyrrhus himself was Alexander's first cousin. Ruling from 306 BCE, at the age of just 13, he was dethroned by Cassander in 302. Without a kingdom, Pyrrhus fought in the wars of the Diadochi and the major battle of Ipsus on the side of the Antigonids. You can learn about this period from our video in the last chapter. After Cassander's death in 297 BCE, Pyrrhus regained his kingdom, with help from the Ptolemies. In 288 BCE, he also managed to wrest control of Macedon and Greece from the Antigonids, until he was driven out by Lysimachus in 285. A renowned general, Pyrrhus was not content to just live out his life in Epirus. The East Mediterranean was closed off to him for now. But as luck would have it, he was invited to the West. Seeking aid in their newly declared war on Rome, Tarentum called for the military genius. After consulting the Oracle of Delphi, Pyrrhus saw this as an opportunity. Fend off the Romans, and perhaps expand his small kingdom to Magna Graecia, and even Sicily. Using that great wealth, Macedon and Greece wouldn't be so hard to recapture. In 280 BCE, Pyrrhus arrived in Italy. He brought with him around 25,000 troops, consisting of his phalanx infantry and cavalry, but he also brought with him a secret weapon the Romans had not yet seen. He gathered mercenaries along the way, tribes who the Romans had a history of conflict with, like the Samnites. This alerted Rome into action. They rallied their legions, totaling 80,000 troops, into four armies. One army was sent to distract the local tribes enough so they couldn't join Pyrrhus. One consul marched north, to prevent the Etruscans from doing the same. One army stayed to protect Rome. And the last army, under the other consul, marched south, to cut off Pyrrhus from the Greek city of Heraclea and there, began the Pyrrhic War. With local help, Pyrrhus commanded 35,000, to Rome's 45,000. It was phalanx against legion, a stalemate that could have gone either way. After the Greek troops thought their king had perished in battle though, it would become a huge morale boost when it was revealed he was still alive. This is when Pyrrhus unveiled his secret weapon. To the Romans, they were lumbering, grey, four-legged giants, stronger than any other single troop. It's often thought the Romans first encountered elephants during the Second Punic War, but Pyrrhus brought twenty of these beasts with him during his intervention. They were loaned by his Ptolemaic allies in Egypt, who also sent fifty more elephants to Epirus, to defend it while Pyrrhus was away. The Roman cavalry broke ranks when faced with the fearsome elephants, and the legions were thrown into chaos. They were then routed by the Greek cavalry. Though Pyrrhus only lost around 3,000 troops, many of them were veterans, and irreplaceable away from home. Not only that, Pyrrhus had noticed the orderly fashion in which these Romans fought and retreated. These weren't like any barbarians he had faced before. 
maybe this war would be harder than it seemed. Pyrrhus decided not to draw it out, and began marching through Campania, and northwest, towards Rome itself. The Greek general managed to add troops to his ranks from smaller tribes in the area, but it wouldn't be enough. Rome's defenses were too great. This put Pyrrhus in a very vulnerable position. The Romans had made peace with the Etruscans, freeing up one of the Roman legions to the north to march back south. The Roman army from Heraclea also reinforced itself, and began marching north. Sandwiched between the two armies, and with no way into Rome, Pyrrhus was forced to take a route to the east. He invaded Apulia, the heel region of the Italian boot, and in 279 BCE, near Asculum, is where he met a Roman army of 40,000, led by the two new Roman consuls. Pyrrhus had the same number of troops, along with 19 remaining war elephants. But the Romans came prepared this time. They constructed 300 wagons to combat the elephants. The wagons contained poles mounted with beams carrying iron tridents, scythes, or grappling irons. They could be maneuvered to protect the sides or front of the wagon. Sometimes fire would be used to heat up iron weapons and throw them at the elephants. Regular bowmen and slingers also rode on the wagon. There are numerous accounts for the Battle of Asculum, but some accounts claim the wagons initially had success, but Pyrrhus either had them destroyed, or moved the elephants to attack the Roman cavalry. The elephants again, were decisive in the victory for the Epirote general. In the end, the Romans lost around 6,000, while Pyrrhus lost around 3,500, again with many veteran commanders. Pyrrhus reportedly claimed after this battle that if they won another battle with the Romans, he would be ruined. This is where the term Pyrrhic victory originates. While Pyrrhus had a hard time replenishing troops, Rome, on home soil, had no such obstacle. Disheartened, Pyrrhus knew it was impossible to continue. But in 278 BCE, he received another plea for help. This time from Syracuse, on Sicily the island he had been hoping to claim since the start. Syracuse had been in an internal power struggle, and sensing weakness, the Carthaginians, controlling the western part of the island, laid siege to the city. Once Pyrrhus arrived though, his army drove them off, and the siege was lifted. A grateful Syracuse proclaimed him king, or tyrant, and with an army reinforced by Syracuse and other neighboring allies, Pyrrhus marched west, conquering the Carthaginian holdings. Carthage was reduced to just the important port of Lilibium. Despite the Carthaginian pleas for peace, Pyrrhus besieged the port, but realized it couldn't be taken without a vast fleet. He also looked to attack Carthaginian territory in Africa. During this campaign, he kept extracting resources and manpower from the rest of Sicily, eventually turning it into his own military dictatorship, and making him vastly unpopular. Once the Sicilians began to turn on him, Pyrrhus of Epirus thought about abandoning the island. The decision was made for him, when he got word that Magna Graecia had been all but lost to the Romans, except for Tarentum. On his return to the mainland, his fleet was attacked and all but destroyed by the Carthaginians. With Sicily lost to him, and now back on the mainland, this cousin of Alexander, still had nothing to show for his conquests. His allies on the mainland now refused to send him aid, as he had left them undefended against Rome, when he left for Sicily. It all ended in 275 BCE, at the battle near Maleventum. Pyrrhus and his remaining troops took on a smaller Roman force. But with seemingly even the gods against him, his army was routed, by his own elephants. Losing over half his army, and fed up of his never-ending cruel luck, Pyrrhus gave up his war, and went back to Epirus. A spotless military record, with numerous battles against both the Romans and Carthaginians, resulting in absolutely no territorial gains. Only the city of Tarentum remained under Epirus. Finally reinforcing his army properly, he had enough men to try for Macedon once again. He briefly became king in 274 BCE and became embroiled in a war between Sparta and Argos. 
Luck never on his side, Pyrrhus ended up fighting in the narrow streets of Argos, and attacked a young soldier. Watching from a rooftop, the soldier's mother hurled a tile at Pyrrhus, knocking him from his horse, and paralyzing him. He was soon beheaded in the muddy streets. A fitting end, for a king who accomplished so much, yet showed so little. Once the Tarentines heard of the king's death, they surrendered to Rome, who now controlled all southern Italy. They later changed the name of Maleventum, which had negative connotation, to Beneventum, which was welcoming and positive. In modern times, it is the city of Benevento. With Syracuse the only Greek presence in the region, this was the domain of two other powers. When Pyrrhus left Sicily to return to mainland Italy, he turned towards the island, the largest in all the Mediterranean, the jewel of the sea, and conceding his defeat, uttered these prophetic words, words which would echo over the Sicilian skies. If only he lived, to see his words come to life.